Hello, and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. My name is Jenna, and I'm so glad that you could tune in with us today. We would love to connect with you, so we invite you to go to the link in the description and fill out our Connect card online. Our vision here at Christ Community Church is to encounter, pursue, and live like Jesus. Our prayer for you today is that no matter what day of the week it is, or where you're watching this message from, that you truly encounter Him. So let's get started. Before I preach is, I want to bring you an update on the next chapter here at Christ Community Church. If you've been with us for a few months, you might remember in the fall, we dug into this a lot. If you're new, let me catch you up really quickly that we are a 47-year-old church that God is still breathing life into and writing pages on the story of what he wants to continue to do here in our community, here in this house. And um, two years ago, uh, the leadership team here was faced with a couple of issues with our building. Don't worry, you're safe. The floor is not going to like cave in or anything, but um, uh, a few issues with our building that need solutions sooner than later. And, um, and the opportunity to potentially uh, repair them or replace them was daunting because it would involve several hundred thousand dollars and we didn't feel like that was the right stewardship for us in, in this time. So we just began to ask the Lord, well, if not that, then what? And he began to just stir up faith in our hearts for more and bigger and something, something different. Long story short, we consulted, um, well, we prayed and fasted as a leadership team. We consulted some of the leadership in the Radiant Network that we're a part of, talked to other pastor friends, even contracted professional consultants to come and speak to us about um, what kind of opportunities we have, what kind of position we're in as a church, what we found out uh, many times over, uh, confirmed over and over again, is we're in a, a very unique an excellent position to do something. And, uh, and so God's adding pages to our, our story. And that's bigger than just the building, but uh, part of those details in that story is that we're going to expand our building specifically out this way where our parking lot lays here. We're going to uh, build 10,000 square feet of new space that will include a new uh, sanctuary to gather and worship and also a coffee house that our desire and our aim is to be open throughout the week to be a gathering place for the presence of God and for our community. That's kind of the key language. So um, recently I was talking to a, a beloved, trusted, highly engaged church leader who said, so when do we break ground? And I was a little, uh, I was stammering, you know, a, a little bit like, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but did you think it was coming soon? Yeah, I just figured we were just ready. Let's just do it, you know? And, uh, and this is a person very involved in things that made me realize, well, maybe there's some confusion elsewhere in the church about exactly where we're at. So I just want to share a project timeline. Um, this is sort of what we showed you in October, and maybe there's a little bit of adjustment to this, but uh, if you look here on this timeline, um, November 2023 is when we began the next chapter, which is a two-year fundraising period where we're, we have a goal to raise $350,000 to add to our savings. Early 2024, which is where we're sitting right now, when we, when we made this and printed this, uh, we were in mid-2023, you know, didn't know exactly where we'd be right now, but I'll, I'll tell you kind of where we are right now. We're going to go all the way through two years of that fundraising to, at a to-be-determined date, be breaking ground, and then begin construction. And here's what needs to happen between now and then. Our key homework is, number one, we're beginning to build coffee into our culture. Um, we don't have it today, but we had uh, coffee last week, and I want to personally thank Rich Kenyon, Rich and Anna. Um, yeah. I'm putting his uh, coffee snob fingerprints all over that. Um, he's building a team right now with a goal to get to coffee every week and then even more coffee options every week and all of those things. If you're interested in, in serving coffee to the church family here, you can talk to Rich after the service and he'd love to consider your offer to, to be on the team. Um, the second thing we need to do is we need to finish this year uh, with a significant surplus in our budget. What that means is we need to spend less than the expected tithe money that will come in throughout the year from your faithful, uh, generous giving. 
And by God's grace, we were able to do that in a major way this past year. In fact, we had a uh, kind of record year, I think, uh, for total revenue, and we came in underspent. And we need to, to do that again this year so that the bank will look and see the surplus and go, okay, they're ready for a mortgage payment now um, in order for us to really feel confident to, to move forward. The other thing, and the final thing I'll mention to you is um, we need to uh, begin work on and finish our construct construction documents. Um, now, you might have uh, remembered from the fall that we have a whole concept image in our booklet, and actually today, if you want to know more about this and don't, uh, you're new to all of this information, want to find out more, um, Beth and Donnie and Sam Zale are going to be hanging out out at the next chapter table right here in the corner, and they love to talk to you more, especially if you're new uh, in the last couple months and would love to catch up with the rest of the church family on this. Um, so you might be thinking, well, we already know what the building's going to look like. Yeah, what we need is documents where we can go to the village next and say, this is what we want to build with this kind of detail, where they can say, okay, we see exactly what you want to do. Here's your permit. And then we can go to a, the construction company that we already have contracted and, uh, and say, here are the details. Do it, right? So that's the homework as it stands. Our goal is to be in this building this is my faith filled. This is, stirs my heart to believe for this and pray for this. And I would ask you to believe for and pray for this with me that we'd be standing in this new space worshiping by July 2026, our 50th anniversary as a church. Would be really cool, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, a couple of weeks ago, Michelle Rennie came up to me and she goes, man, God's done something really cool. I would love to share this with the church family. And I've asked her to share. If you want to put your hands together, welcome Michelle to come share a, a testimony with us related to the next chapter. Take it away, Michelle. Um, hello. I'm on. Okay. Uh, I love to share God's faithfulness to us. And man, this week I could give you 10 stories of God's faithfulness. But for today, I'm going to share the one that we talked about. Uh, so when it came time to the next chapter and it came time to giving, it wasn't a question of when we, Mark and I prayed, it wasn't a question of if we were going to give, it was how much we were going to give. Because this has been in the plans for years and years and years. And I'm probably one of those people that like, let's get a shovel and do this thing today um, kind of person. But I know that there's a process. Okay, I'll be patient. Um, so it came time to, you know, make that commitment. And so we had prayed about a specific number and, you know, didn't really think too much about it. Like how would we come up with that every month? It was just of, we're going to come up with it every month. There wasn't a question of how, but we will. So we gave, you know, we, uh, we committed and weeks went by and I get a text from, um, my, boss and says, hey, we're going to give you uh, a Christmas bonus. It wasn't called a bonus. Um, she said something else, but I'm going to say it was a Christmas bonus. And I thought to myself, well, why? <laughs> that's the first thing I said. Um, and then I thought, oh, well, that's cool. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Thank you. You know. And then uh, another week and a half went by and she sent me another text and said, um, so we're, we're going to give you a raise. And I was like, why? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I missed the conversation where I went into her office and demanded a title and more money and cleared a desk. And, um, and I just was dumbfounded. And so when I went home that night, I said, Mark, do you know that between the Christmas bonus and the raise that I just got, it literally is the same amount that we pledged for the next quarter. I mean, the next chapter. Sorry, that's a different thing. The next chapter. And um, we laughed. I laughed. I, I giggled. I laughed. I was amazed. And then I went, of course, of course, that's what God does. So it wasn't even something I prayed for. I didn't ask for the provision. Um, I just knew it would be there. And I had no idea. So I really like getting those texts from my boss. But um, so I think take that step of faith. You know, I, there were a lot of words today of taking that step of faith. And even before I came to church, I read that they had to step their foot into the water for it to part in order for them to cross. So if you have a, your, your question should be, how much am I going to give and not if I'm going to give, if this is your house, if this is your house of the Lord and you want to see it go into the next generation and see that all God has to do um, because he will blow you away uh, with what he gives to you. So thank you. Give that to you. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. And if anyone wants to encourage Michelle with different negotiation tactics for the next raise, you can hit her up after the service. No, I, I um, obviously was so joyful with 
you, Michelle, when you shared that with me. And I pray for many other such encounters for our church family. One of the things that a local pastor encouraged us when our leadership team went to just meet with them. They had just built this like gigantic, amazing thing. And we just went to ask questions and just say, what should we pray about, consider? They said, you have no idea the miracles you're going to see in this process. You can't account for them. You can't take them to the bank and say, but there are going to be miracles. But when you step into this kind of window where you're believing God for something great, those miracles come. And that's one such miracle. We've heard one from Holly, and I pray that we'll hear more and more as we go. Uh, our goal is $350,000. We currently, as of just a few hours ago this morning, uh, stand at 258590 That means we need about 91000 more to be pledged towards the next chapter for us to finish this goal. Uh, and I'm believing the Lord for it, and I know you are too. So... Would you pray with me? We're going to shift gears into the message uh, this morning. And would you just pray quickly, just stir up your hunger in your own heart. Don't just listen to my prayer, but pray your own prayer of God. I want to hear your word. Lord Jesus, I'm reminded of the scripture this morning that there is trembling at your word. Lord, would you help us to treat your word with reverence and honor? <laughs> God, that your word would be enough for us to encounter you and know you more today. Stir up our hunger and our faith to believe for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've been in this series, Begin With Beholding, and just the, the real quick idea around this is that sometimes we get in our own way, <laughs> or sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. Uh, sometimes we get hyper-focused on this one little itty-bitty thing and we miss the greater focus that God is trying to bring us to or the greater point. Um, sometimes our personal preference for something drives us in a direction that is actually headed away from the desire that God is trying to lead us to and all of those kinds of things. And so uh, we want to bring your attention to the fact that the best use of our time this morning is to draw attention to Jesus. <laughs> The best use of our time is drawing our attention to Jesus. He is perfect theology. He is the fullness of God. The Bible teaches us he is God visible to our eyes. Every time you open to the Gospels, every time you open to the Scriptures, you can see God visible. He's even better, he's accessible today. He's available, he's humble, he's wonderful. And so if you've ever felt frustrated at any point in time, like, man, faith just seems so complicated. There's just so many rules and so many things to do and so many things not to do and not to say and all of that. Um, this sermon is, is for you and it's for everyone in the room that we're just gonna focus on Jesus today and let the rest worry about itself. Does that sound okay? Um, my message today is Jesus, the wisdom and beauty of God. Uh, you know, when we started this series, this was my big idea. I, I just want to take eight weeks or more and just talk about Jesus and just draw attention to Jesus. And uh, there's been some thought behind the scenes when I'm in the office and, and praying and seeking the Lord and just saying, God, what do you want me to share? What, how do you want to feed your people? How do you want to meet with them on, on Sunday morning with the, the time that we have? And time is such a measurable you know, you, you will only give so much of it, I know. How do I make it worth their time, Lord? <laughs> and, and, and the expectations and, and things in the room that you'd like to see happen or like to hear us talk about and whatever that is, I just want to ask you, and I'm doing it too, to just set it all to the side so that the one thing left on the table is Jesus. <laughs> that he is the wisdom of God. He is the beauty of God of God. And, um, you know, thinking about wisdom and beauty this last week, uh, consider, consider the original wisdom chaser with me for a minute, okay? And there are many people, many um, Greek philosophers or Renaissance artists 
or modern minds who've impacted the scientific community who would tell you wisdom is the ultimate. You, you, the search for wisdom should consume your life more than anything else. Um, it, it was the thing that one man named Solomon in Israel's history did ask the Lord for. In fact, the Lord came to him in a dream and said, ask me for anything, I'll give it to you. Wow. I would love to know the secret thoughts of your mind of what you would ask for <laughs> right now. You wouldn't like us to all know that, and I, would, I wouldn't want to put them on the screen or anything, but just consider that for, for an eye. You know, when you watch Aladdin and he rubs the, the lamp and boom, there's a genie saying, what do you wish for? You can have it. And how, how many of us know immediately we'd have to whittle it down from the hundred things that we w- could ask for. What would be the, the one thing? Well, Solomon very appropriately noticing that he was becoming king over Israel after his father David, who had led Israel into this amazing, successful, prosperous time. And he's looking at his own life going, I'm inadequate. And so he responds to this invitation from the Lord. He says, give me wisdom. Give me an understanding heart so I know the difference between right and wrong. And the Lord took great delight in that, in answering that. And and over the course of Solomon's life, the scripture tells us he wrote over 3,000 proverbs and over 1,000 songs, and he became famous, and emissaries would come from other nations to be amazed at Solomon's wisdom. And yet, in Ecclesiastes 1, this same wise Solomon writes, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Do you feel encouraged this morning by the scriptures? (laughs) I said to myself, Solomon speaking about himself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone. I've applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and madness and folly. And I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom, well, I think actually my translation today says, mo wisdom, mo problems, Jenna. I think that's what it says, okay? <clears throat> because wisdom in and of itself like anything else in this life, apart from God's love and leadership and a relationship with him, becomes just that meaningless. (laughs) Leads to madness. Um, Beauty. Beauty. Did you know there's a battlefield of beauty happening all around you and within you constantly, 24-7? I think it was Mary who talked about how manipulated we are at Wegmans to buy, you know, certain things and put them in your cart, right? Right? that there's a war for your attention and it's not just Wegmans, it's everything on the internet and social media, it's every political party, it's everything around you is trying to shove something in your face so that you'll look at it and go, oh, that looks nice, I need that. It's a war for your attention to attract you to things that are not good and not good for you. And this definition of what is or is not beautiful according to who? According to what? According to, right? Like who who is defining around you and influencing you what is beautiful or is not beautiful? Well, this morning my message to you is Jesus is the wisdom and the beauty of God. Not the wisdom of this world, not the beauty of this age, not what leaves you empty and meaningless, but a wisdom and beauty that comes from knowing that a sinless Savior died for you to rescue you from a meaningless life, chasing after the wind, to give you incredible meaning and value and significance because that's what the cross represents. That someone saw your life ahead of time and everything about you that you don't feel is beautiful according to the standard of beauty in this world And everything about you that you feel inadequate about that is not wise according to the wisdom of this world. And every mistake you would make and every offensive sin that you would carry in your heart when you would rebel against God to chase after happiness apart from him. Still, he looked at your whole life and then looked at the cross and said, it's worth it. They are worth it. Because of the desire of God's heart, to rescue and reconcile. Jesus said, I'll do it. (laughs) Not my will, your will. And your will, Father, takes me to a cross 
That's what we're going to talk about today with our time that's left. Because in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul, who's writing to a church that means a lot to him, means a lot to him. He had a lot of words to say in 1 and 2 Corinthians. You can turn there with me if you have your Bible this morning, 1 Corinthians 1. He said, I came to preach the gospel, in verse 17, not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ will be emptied of its effect. Huh. Interesting. Interesting thought right off the bat that it is possible to put makeup on and and jewelry on and dress it up and bedazzle the message of Christ to the point where it is of no effect any longer. So, he says, I'll just keep it simple for you this morning. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to those who are being saved. For it is written, and this is a quote from Isaiah 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Verse 21, for since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. Did you know it is possible to be wise and not know God? It makes sense how Solomon could get so upside down in it. And we don't know exactly where it all went wrong, but it probably has something to do with his hundreds of wives who served pagan gods and slowly intentionally drew his heart away from the one true living God, the God of his father David, the God who David chased after even though he wasn't a perfect man and made some horrendous, humongous mistakes in his life, still would come back and humble himself and chase after the presence of God and say, take this crown, take this palace, take this kingdom. I don't care one thing I'm asking for. Somehow Solomon though, I kind of switched around. I'm chasing after. I gave my life to wisdom and found it's all meaningless in the end. So God was pleased, Paul said, to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks ask for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now typically, defining factors for wisdom in our day, uh, and I'm simplifying this because I'm a simple person. Um, You know, typically we look at something that can be proven scientifically and say, I see the wisdom. Um, Or it's beneficial to your life practically. I see the wisdom in this, this advice, this, you know, generational advice handed down from your uh, grandparents, parents, whatever, things that don't change even when technology changes. This is still the same. That's wisdom, okay. Um, Or things that produce or at least claim to produce your desired, you know, goal in the end. But God's wisdom is foolishness in this world. There's no science per se, although I do believe there's a lot about science that glorifies God. And I, you know, Just go watch Lou Giglio's stuff online. He does a better job with it um, than I will today. But Paul says, if you're chasing after wisdom and you expect uh, to find God there, well, God's wisdom is foolishness to this world. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so pause there for a second. Pause for a second. Now let's think about beauty. We talked about the battlefield of beauty and what is beautiful. Um, The war for your attention. Well, the psalmist in in, uh, Psalm 96, we quoted it already this morning, give to the Lord the glory due his name. I said that to you once. Then he says this, bring an offering, come into his courts or his presence or come near to him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of, of holiness. When was the last time you saw an Instagram post, tabloid, or otherwise that said, this is holiness beauty right here? If you use this, you know, CoverGirl product, you'll get to holiness beauty level. (laughs) We don't talk a lot about that in our world. Holy means to be set apart, sacred, consecrated, as unto the Lord. And the psalmist wrote this psalm having experienced God through a tent with a box covered in gold that represented the presence of God. That David himself said, let's go 
and establish this as the center of everything in our lives and our nation and my kingship. I want everything to be about this one thing. Then we're going to come and bring offerings, not of bulls or rams or, you know, all that stuff. Um, that's happening in, the, in Moses' tent down the road. But we're going to bring broken and contrite hearts in songs, in prayer. And it's going to be 24-7 because there's never a moment in our day on our clock where he's not worthy. How much more? under a new covenant, having seen in the scriptures about Christ and heard the testimony about God's holiness that now dwells in us, his temple, because of his son Jesus. Could we cry out, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Samuel Whitefield, in his book, Discipleship Begins with Beholding, which was a large inspiration to this series, He said, many people find what Jesus did on the cross noble, but do not find the crucified Son of God beautiful. All of heaven, on the contrary, is captivated by the slain lamb. (laughs) His suffering permanently marked him. It has become a part of his beauty. The crucifixion is the deepest revelation of God's nature in this age. And if you do not see God as beautiful in his suffering, then you probably don't find God beautiful. What do we find beautiful this morning? Um, Do you find creativity beautiful, right? Like an artist or an invention or something where something is, you know, kind of from an idea in someone's mind produced into something visible and you go, wow, that's, that's beautiful. Consider that the very gift of creativity, the potential for it was given to you by a father who loves you. How about, uh, how about stories, human stories uh, of amazing triumph or overcoming? You know, if you've ever heard a story or, or, or heard a retelling, maybe, of our time in history where, where slaves were delivered out of bondage into freedom and a kind of life where they could um, have families and homes and vote and be honored citizens. Now, you might be thinking about U.S. history. I'm thinking about Israel's history as well. A story of God that initiated with the heart of God. I've heard their prayers and he came with miracle power to deliver these people out of a land of bondage into a promised land, which of course is just a foretelling of the gospel. (laughs) Where we could be delivered from our own bondage to sin and delivered into the freedom and liberty that we have access to because of the cross. How about adoption? (laughs) Is there anything more beautiful than the thought of adoption, of bringing a child out of a precarious situation that they may be in and into a loving and stable family where someone could literally like reach outside of and, and say, you're not my flesh and blood, but you're part of my family now. How beautiful that is. That's exactly what the gospel says happened because of Jesus' cross. You can be adopted into, from from spiritual orphanhood where you don't know who loves you, who cares about you, what your purpose is, where you came from, what is the point of all this, meaningless, 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 to I have meaning and significance as a child of God. I say beautiful. I say beautiful. All of this is found in the cross. And the defining moment of God's wisdom and beauty is the cross of his son, Jesus. How could the cross be wisdom, you might say, or some may say? It doesn't seem very smart for Jesus at the height of his miracle working and teaching and influence to die and hand off the mission to his followers who up till that point just seemed to make a lot of messes and mistakes. Doesn't seem very wise. And yet Jesus in John 12 says, the hours come for the son of man to be glorified. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Behold the wisdom of God. Well, it doesn't seem very beautiful it seems gruesome. It seems gross. I've seen the passion of the Christ. 
Ugh, that's intense. Nowhere has beauty ever been seen more evident than at the cross of Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 15, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. How could the greatest love ever to touch this planet not be beautiful? How could we call it not beautiful? Um, Crystal, I'm going to skip a, a slide here. Let's just go right to behold the wisdom and beauty of God. Thank you so much. Isn't it wonderful that we have people that would give their Sunday to help you sing and follow along? Behold the wisdom and beauty of God and his son on the cross. I want to just tell you the story once again. Um, It might even be appropriate for you to close your eyes for the next couple minutes. You don't have to do that, but sometimes when your eyes are closed, you're not distracted by what's going on around you and you can hear differently, right? Right? that the Gospels tell us that leading up to the moments where Jesus would be on the cross, that the first thing that happened was he was betrayed by the kiss of a friend in a garden called Gethsemane where he was praying. That a mob came with torches and swords and pitchforks to grab him and arrest him in the night like a dangerous revolutionary. Consider that Jesus restrained his great power And let them arrest him that night. Because in Matthew 26, Jesus said to Peter, who pulled out his sword ready to fight, Jesus said, do you think I can't call on my father and he would provide me here and now 72,000 angels ready to fight and deliver me? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? He restrained his power, and he let them arrest him. He was led and subjected to an unjust trial with many false testimonies. He was spit on, punched, slapped by a crowd who mocked him and said, now prophesy to us who just slapped you and now consider the fact that he knew their name exactly. And the very hands that came from the crowd to slap him on the face, that he was the one holding together the creative power of God that would make the very fingerprints of that hand. He was brought by the mob to the Roman governor Pilate who thoroughly interrogated Jesus and declared him completely innocent. He offered to release Jesus back to them, but instead they asked for a criminal named Barabbas instead. When the Roman governor asked the crowd, well, what do I do with this Jesus? Then they screamed, crucify him. And so Pilate washed his hands and delivered Jesus over to Roman soldiers who were experts at such a task. They stripped him naked. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And while the soldiers mocked and taunted him, they spit on him and struck him in the head with sticks. Then they whipped him with a a whip that was called flogging or scourging where the the whip had lead-tipped hooks on the end that was designed to grip into human flesh and be pulled back on and tear the flesh away. It's from those very moments we see Isaiah 53, 5 revealed that by his wounds or stripes we could find healing. He was stripped naked and mocked and paraded in shame through the streets of Jerusalem, carrying the full weight of a cross that was designed for criminals and destined for you and me. Jesus, the beloved Son of God, the bright and morning star of heaven, the willing healer who released so many from sickness and torment, And the very same one who cried with Mary and Martha in front of their brother Lazarus' tomb, the one who just days before was honored and welcomed with singing, had come to the hill called Golgotha to die for the sins of the world, where he willingly laid down on the rough wood for Roman crucifixion, where nails were driven through his wrists and his feet, 
These nails were nine inches long and fashioned of heavy iron, more like railroad spikes to our eyes. This was considered the most brutal and shameful way for a person to die. Jesus Christ, the perfect beloved Son of God, endured all of this. After crying out for the forgiveness of those who were responsible and crying out to the Father, he did finally offer up his spirit and surrender to death with a final breath. It has been studied in the medical community that crucifixion victims would die from various causes including organ failure or even respiratory failure. And John 19.34 tells us that a soldier, to make sure Jesus was dead, stabbed his side with a spear and blood and water came out, referring to the watery fluid that surrounds the heart when the human body is under extreme stress and pressure like a body is when it hangs from hooks in its hands. having taken upon himself the full separation between God and man that mankind experiences because of sin. It was the first time the father had to look away from his son in all the eternity of their existence together. And so the soldier stabbed his side and blood and water poured out. It could be possible that it was Jesus dying from a literal broken heart that caused the release of this water and blood. Why would he do this? Jesus told his disciples over and over and over again to fulfill the scriptures. Well, what do the scriptures say, you might ask? In summary, they tell us about a God whose desire is to forgive and redeem and rescue and transform and glorify a covenant people who will put their faith and trust in his son. And the cross is the instrument that makes all of this possible. Worship team, would you um, come back up whatever you guys have prepared Friends, I have nothing else to add to my sermon today. The message of the cross didn't need Paul's eloquent wisdom, and it certainly doesn't need mine. If I could remind you, Paul said, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to those who are being saved. To those who are called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And I would say to you once more, behold the wisdom and beauty of God in his son on the cross this morning. I want to create an opportunity for you to respond to this message. If anyone here wants to respond to the wisdom and beauty and power of God and the message of his son Jesus dying on the cross, I want to invite you to bow low this morning. I'm not going to invite you up to the stage. I'm not inviting you to stand. I'm not inviting you really to do anything except this one thing. If you want to respond to the wisdom and beauty and power of God, I want to invite you to consider kneeling right in your chair, right where you're at, or if you need to step out into the aisle where you can move around anywhere you want to. But Romans 10 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word or message of Christ and I pray you've heard that message clearly today about who he is. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so, my final seconds here, who here has heard the message of Christ? If you could close your eyes one more time. Who here feels called to respond to this message? Who here needs to recommit your life maybe 
to God's wisdom and beauty in his son Jesus on the cross. And I would say to you this morning, Jesus said he must be raised up in order to draw all men to himself. And before the son of God raised up on the cross, do you want to respond and kneel before him today? If you want to respond that way, go ahead and, and move right now. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Jesus wasn't worried about people's opinions of him when he allowed all that I just read to you to happen to him physically. He did it out of love and I would invite you out of love this morning to respond to the message of the cross and kneel and make yourself low before him. And let the Spirit of God just move in your heart right now that having heard the message of Christ preached, that you'd believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Right now, anyone who hasn't moved yet, who knows they need to bow and humble themselves before Jesus, the crucified Savior, would you go ahead and just move right now and let God work in your heart let the Spirit of God reveal to you this Jesus, this Son of God, this beloved Son of God, this perfect, sinless man, this spotless lamb, the scriptures call him, who is a, a fulfillment of the Passover lamb when God spoke to Moses and the Israelites and said, take a spotless, perfect lamb and take its blood and paint it over the doorpost so that when I visit Egypt tonight, I will pass over because of the blood. There won't be judgment on the house that has blood from the lamb on the doorpost. And today, Jesus, we respond and we say, we see you, Jesus, the, the perfect spotless lamb. It's your blood that causes God to pass over. And instead of wrath, we receive mercy. Instead of punishment, we receive grace. And instead of the full weight and debt of our sin, we receive the free gift of God in Christ. faith stirring up in your heart. The kind of faith it takes to believe that someone would die for you like that. And also the kind of faith it takes to believe that no autopsy can be done on this body because there is no body in the grave. Because Jesus was awakened in resurrection life and power on the third day and the stone was rolled away and he walked out of the grave and that perfect spotless lamb now can be seen in beauty with the mark still in his hands and his feet and in his side representative of the sacrifice he gave once and for all come see his hands come see his feet come see his side this morning by the spirit of God revealing himself to you respond for yourself this morning with that faith in your heart by confessing with your mouth Jesus you are Lord 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 Jesus you are Lord
Jesus, I'm asking that the power of God and the wisdom of God would come reveal himself here in this place right now. With more than words, with more than a sermon and more than songs, that you come reveal yourself with a demonstration of your power. As we bow before you in reverence, in acknowledgement that you are lifted up, would you come demonstrate here in the room? Would there be testimonies in the room after these moments of your presence and your power and your voice and your healing touch? That's nothing I could ever do. That's nothing any church leader could ever do. There is no power in us. It's just your power. It's just your wisdom. It's just your willing touch, healing touch, healing word. That as we bow low, we have the right perspective to look up and see you as you are. Because now you're not just lifted up on a cross to draw men to yourself. You're lifted up and given the name that is above every other name because you were willingly obedient to the Father's plan for you to go to this cross we've been talking about. Because of your obedience, the Father's given you the name that is above every other name and given you a seat, a throne, for all eternity that is above every other throne. You have all authority, Jesus, and so you have all the permission you need to move in the room right now and reveal yourself to someone who didn't know you when they walked in. Reveal yourself to someone who came in asking and wondering, is God real? What does he think about me? What will happen today in church? Jesus, would you come show yourself? Come show up for them. Come respond to their hunger for you. Come respond to our faith in you right now. Pour out your grace. Pour out your grace. Pour out your grace this morning. Pour out your grace this morning. You're the God who sets captives free. God, would you set someone free this morning? from a chain that's been on their life? Would you set someone free this morning from a thought that has taken them captive for years? Would you set someone free this morning from the pain that has enshackled them since they were young? Would you set us free this morning from addiction? Set us free this morning from temptation? Set us free this morning from the things that seem so incredibly powerful in our lives. But we declare today, Jesus, you're the wisdom of God. You're the beauty of God. You're the power of God. Come and demonstrate who you are in the room.
else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you. Come on, if you see him this morning as worthy, sing. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? no one only you sing it one more time who else is worthy who else is worthy For me, the part about beholding the beauty and the wisdom of the cross that I don't know that I'll ever fully be able to understand is that he went willingly. He went for you, not just the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, beside you. Willingly, he didn't look at you and say, you put me here. This is your fault. He willingly did that for you, for me. How could anybody be more worthy? How could anybody love more deeply than Jesus? There's so many things about beholding the cross and seeing the beauty of it, but that willingness, that love that we can barely scratch the surface of has us coming back again to Jesus to say thank you, only you are worthy. And the only thing he asks you in response is for your heart. Pastor Brad said the scripture that was on my heart, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and have eternal life. That's all he asks. We sang today about how you can't earn it. There's really nothing that you can do. You can't clean yourself up enough to come before him. You can't do any of that. You can't do any of that. He just wants your heart. He just wants you to confess that he is Lord and believe that he went for you willingly and no one will ever compete with that love. I know we've already responded to that today. Some of you are still on your knees and that's great. Stay there. Go there if you need to. Do whatever you need to do, but let's respond to him once again. Lord, only you are worthy. Only you are worthy. Only your love is truly pure. God, we could spend a lifetime trying to understand it, and we might only scratch the surface, but God, draw us in deeper. We want more of you. We want more of this love. We know that you've called us, and we want to share this love with those around us. God, we commit ourselves to you today to confess that you are Lord over and over and over again, even when we failed, even when we know better, even when we know we're not worthy, we will confess that you are Lord because we know in our hearts that you rose from the grave. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. God, let us truly behold the wisdom and the beauty of the cross. Help us not to complicate it. Help us not to put our own spin on it. Help us not to be influenced by things that would sully it. Help us to only be influenced by the fact that you willingly went and died and rose again for us. We're so grateful, Jesus. We're so grateful. And we commit ourselves to you again. In Jesus' name, amen.